Hi everyone and welcome to today's session. Uh, today we'll be discussing one of the more recent papers that tries to use large language models as general pattern machines. So this is a bit different from the traditional sense of a large language model because usually we think a large language model is about completing words, completing text, like I am a, then you blank that, like I am a student or the cat set on the mat. So these are the typical use cases of large language models. But on this paper, in this paper, they showed that large language models to a certain extent can be used to associate arbitrary symbols or arbitrary tokens. So I also did some experiments on this and uh, let's take a look at uh, what they have to say and also some of the additional experiments I did. So this is exactly what I said earlier. LMs are great for handling text, but can LMs represent, manipulate, and extrapolate more abstract non-linguistic patterns? So this is a, an interesting question that we can ask ourselves. And this is done in this paper via three approaches. So the first approach is the sequence transformation approach, where we can try to learn rules of the environment, like on this abstract reasoning corpus, which is what I'm working on as well. Like you have to try to like group certain shapes into a certain color, like based on the maximum color of each rectangle here, you group into um, this pass. So this kind of sequence transformation problems usually involve finding out rules that are not told to the program. And you are supposed to use these rules to come up with like the end outcome. So you transform from the original sequence to the end sequence. Okay, over here, they use images as a sequence. Like how to represent that, we'll talk about that later. So like a sequence to sequence transformation involves associating between the input space and the output space. So LMs can do that. Yeah, we have seen LMs can do translation in different languages. I'm very sure uh, LMs can do sequence transformation. The second thing that um, the paper talks about is sequence completion. So this is quite interesting also. Because this means that given like a starting sequence, can I extrapolate? Can I fill in the gaps? Okay, or fill or like do some form of prediction of what will go on. Like in this curve, can I see what, that the values will go increasing order? I mean, the, the magnitude will increase. Can the LLM do that? All right. So this can be useful for stuff like predicting sequences over time. Yeah. So there are some tabular data that might be able to use this kind of stuff. And lastly, uh, also this is the one that I, I interested me the most, sequence improvement, all right? Because, you know, in reinforcement learning, I mean, the authors did a lot of reinforcement learning. And the main thing in reinforcement learning is trying to improve the policy or your actions that a certain agent takes such that you get higher reward. So they investigated whether or not you can get higher reward just by giving some examples to the large language model and trying to use these examples to condition on it to generate another sequence that has high reward. So this is something like retrieval augmented generation. You have different kinds of sequences here. This is your context. You have like sequence A, sequence B, sequence C, and then you try to generate new sequence. Sequence D, X, and then you generate the, the rest. So, so this is quite interesting because this can be done. I mean, I, I've tried before. This can be done. And yeah, let's take a look at the, the paper and we see how all these three are done in this paper. Um, before that, uh, anything you all like to ask or clarify on this slide or anything before? Okay. So this is uh, what I described earlier in, in a blocks form. So, you know, typically in large language models, we try to do the like sequence completion, we try to do it within distribution. Like that means like if you've seen the cat set on the map during your training examples, you can quite quite expect the model to say that the, the dog set on the map or something similar to the training example, you expect it to work. But can the large language model do things that are outside of your training distribution? Like you have never seen a certain like pattern. Like for example, in your in, in your training sequence, maybe you only have A, B, D, B, C, D. You know, suddenly I give you this A, B, C, A, C, A, B. Like you have never seen this sequence before. All right. In fact, if you map it back to the LM, these tokens might be like 
it, it can be different languages. Like you can be like something in English, like I, and then like in Chinese, war. Then like in French, it's like jet, jet, okay, jet mapel or something like that. Yeah. So this is like you have different arbitrary tokens that don't make sense at all. No, no sense at all. No linguistic sense. Nothing ever seen before in the training distribution. Can this random sequence of tokens map to another like random sequence of tokens? Can we do something like that? So that is a very interesting question to ask. Okay. Can the large language model perform just as a pattern matcher? So the three tasks that we've seen earlier, if we want to do something like sequence transformation, like over here, what rules are we giving this? This is transform according to rule. So what rules are we giving it here? In this case, I just made a very simple rule. The rule is from A, you map to B. From B, map to C. Let me just write it here. I, I made a few simple rules. From A, map to B. B maps to C. And C maps to A. So this simple rules uh, resulted in this sequence transformation. And we would like to see like whether or not the large language model can learn that. So this is exactly sequence transformation. right? What is sequence completion? All right? Sequence completion, as you saw earlier, like the, in the graph that when someone you want to see, like given this as the starting sequence, what is the resulting sequence here? Like how, if I extend the sequence, what will it be? And so this is sequence completion. You can see that we completed it with CAC, like because like this whole thing, you can say to repeat like one time, you can just repeat that again. So can the large language model do something like that? So that's the branch two that the authors are investigating. And the last branch is the sequence improvement, like to generate better and better sequences. And so for this, what we'll do is we can condition, like maybe you take a few actions or like these are the states that you have visited, like A, B, C, D, A, A, A. So like once you, over here, once you end off with the state D, you get a reward one, all right? So can the model learn this and then given this starting situation, just end off with D? All right, so I will cover this later in, in detail. This um this is a very simplistic way of the, just saying like state, state. This is like in this format, reward, state, state, state. Yeah. So this this need not be the way that uh, we do it. I mean, it will be easier if you can do like that. Reward, state, action, state, action. Because you will need to have like a state transition matrix. You cannot just like, let the LM predict a state because sometimes when you go from state one to state two, you know, it need not be feasible. All right. You 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 might need to construct some form of a graph like that. Okay, so graphs are very important. Uh, last week I thought about like knowledge graphs. I believe this kind of knowledge graph can also be used in this kind of reinforcement learning style stuff. Like to construct this kind of a Markov decision process. So this is like called a Markov decision process. If you have some notes of the state and some actions. If you can go and Google this, this is called Markov decision process. So I think like, because in some of the experiments in this paper, they only did state, 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 state. Yeah, I think that that's not exactly that good because you don't know whether the state can link to another state. Uh, you, you probably need to have some form of action to link them together. So yeah, that's more or less uh, it for, for their overall view. So let us zoom in on the first one, okay? So this is the key question that um, this paper is trying to target, which is, are uh, in-distribution tokens necessary for the test time performance? So if I use arbitrary tokens, like what I said earlier, like I, jump, jump, appeal, war, you know, that kind of thing, like it's very, very random tokens. Can this still be used to do pattern matching? Like, do I need to preserve the same kind of distribution as training time? So. The surprising result is that even you map to a randomly sampled token, you can still generate valid solutions. Okay, provided you ground it in, 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 in enough like input output examples, like in the app challenge, you can still generate valid solutions. So this is interesting because LLMs might gen generate general capabilities of representing and extrapolating these symbolic patterns. Okay, the key thing is invariant to the specific tokens involved. Okay, this is a very, very strong claim. Okay, and it's a claim that I'm going to show that it's not true. All right, this is not true. All right, if you put random tokens, it will hurt performance. All right, yeah, with some tokens, because, all right, the tokens still carry some semantic meaning. 
So if, if you know how the transformer maps the tokens, like this is the transformer, and then you have your tokens over here, like your tokens will get mapped to an embedding space and then put into the transformer, right? So the, the thing is when you do into random tokens, your tokens carry embedding meaning. Like basically the meaning itself is already like in, in like the 2D space that I normally like to draw. Like you have like cat, house, or this like, let's say this is your embedding space, the 2D. This part here will be something like a cat. This point here will be something like dog. And then one point down here, this point here is something like house. So, so you can see that like based on the token that you have given, you already have an embedding an embedding space that is already learned. Like over here, we can distinguish between living and non-living things in this embedding space. Like if I suddenly change the token randomly from cat to house, you know, sometimes it, most of the time it will affect performance. Okay, so this paper, although it's an interesting one, I don't agree with their conclusion, okay, that LM's behavior is invariant to the specific tokens involved, right? Because I, I did the up challenge extensively and how you put the tokens actually matter, like for the representation of the input view. So, yeah, so this, um, they acknowledge this in the paper. They said that um, you, using random of abstract label mappings retain some performance. Okay, so actually all this two came from the original paper, but they cited this thing here. What makes in-context learning work? They cited another paper uh, that showed that even if they randomly perturb the output labels, the large language model can still learn. All right, so that paper uh, did it for their use case because they randomly perturb, but then the, the main kind of labels are still there. I mean, majority are still correct. Yeah, so it's like seeing how robust the large language model is to noise, all right? But going back to the main point that the authors claim in this paper, they said that using random mappings won't change much, will retain the performance. I don't agree with this. Okay, I, I don't know whether you have played around with it. You just take any sentence that you, you have, like you do some in-context learning. Like, for example, you want to do something like that. Like maybe... A, B, C, D is a yes. So whenever it ends with a D is a yes. Like you try to play around with this, you change the symbols a bit, you change the D to F, change the D to full stop, change the D to comma, you know. I'm very sure that um, if you were to do this randomly, you will find a combination that somehow doesn't seem to work as well as as it did uh, if, with the original token. So like maybe you have like A, B that you ask like whether is it yes or no. Yeah, so based on like how you manipulate these tokens, sometimes you might um, not be able to get the same results as you use ABCD because like ABCD gen generally if you use like single letters, they don't really convey much meaning because like a single word letter um, doesn't mean much. Like ABC are just like placeholders most of the time. So so you do it's okay to use like that, but if you were to change the words to something that you have seen more often like dog, man bone, you know, that kind of thing, this will likely affect performance. Okay, I have some experiments to show this. So let's uh, take a look. So yes, you, okay, so let me just explain. Uh, this is the example I'll be using for the next few slides. So if we could just change the output sentiment, all right, so instead of like saying positive, negative, okay, I just say foo and bar, all right, so in this case, who is the same as positive and bar is the same as negative. So I use GPD uh, 3.5, which is chat GPT, and I say like, oh, the movie is great, sentiment full, which means it's a good positive sentiment, all right? The ice cream tastes horrible, okay? This is bar, this is like a bad negative sentiment. Movie was boring, negative or, or neutral, okay? But it's not positive. And last one, LMs are the best thing ever. So what do you expect this to be? This is a, a, a positive example. So you expect it to be like full. All right, so GPT got it right. Let's see Lama 2, all right? Lama 2, the most uh, hyped up open source model. Yeah, you got it right. So great job, Lama 2. Uh, Lama 2 is actually not too bad for, for this kind of stuff. All right, so 
it works. Yeah, I randomly map some tokens and it still works. Okay, this is in line with what this paper has said. This is what makes in context learning work. This is in line with the findings from here. Okay, but people haven't perturbed it as much as I have. So let's take a look at what I did next. Now, instead of, okay, doing the sentiment here, okay, I perturb it, all right, according to the, the top here. So the text itself, okay, I don't perturb the label, I perturb the text. So previously, in the in the previous example, I perturb the label, which is the classification. I perturb, perturb it to be full and bar. Now I do the text itself. So the movie is full means the movie is great, uh, negative. The ice cream taste bar means the ice cream taste positive, like taste great. So this is the association I would like the model to learn. Okay, but you see, I changed this thing here. LMs are the full thing ever. It's positive. Okay, which is wrong. It's supposed to be negative. Okay, I I I meant for full to be negative, right? Say same thing over here. Okay, so this is uh on on, on the left, okay, is just uh, changing the text. On the right, we are changing both the text and the sentiment. So you can see that what I want this to do is I want it to associate like full output bar. Okay, output the opposite. And over here, I'm supposed to output bar. Okay, but what is happening is that the sentiment is still positive. So you see, meaning, okay, let me explain to you why I think the one on the left Oh yeah, uh, so you asked whether I test on GPT-4, uh, that will be the next slide. Okay, so this is the GPT-3.5 uh, or chat GPT slide first. So let me explain why I think the large average model outputs like that. Because of this exclamation mark. Okay. This exclamation mark typically associated with happy sentiments or exclamation. Like you don't, I mean, of course you can say the movie was horrible or LMs are the most horrible thing. Exclamation mark. You can do that, but the chance of uh, exclaiming for a happy event is probably higher than exclaiming for a disgusting event or unhappy event. At least that's what I see online. Okay, maybe the distribution can change, but um, this is typically associated with positive stuff. So the LLM did not manage to find out that, okay, this fool itself is the one that's causing it. Okay, but they probably paid some attention to like the punctuation mark. I mean, the way to test it is to change this to full stop and see whether it works. Okay, so this is my uh my own guess on why it is. Anyone would like to guess like why this output here is positive instead of bar? Like anyone would like to offer some reasons why you think the LM is not able to give you bar? All right, because you seen earlier, this works like full bar, full bar. This works, it gives you full. But why in this case it failed to give you? Like, okay, so. This is my, uh, uh, again, my take on this, all right? I believe that this is because like it is unable to find out what's the meaning of this here in the text. Okay, so it's, it's, most of it is text. You just change one to a random token. Okay, it, it's not able to associate that well. Okay, so what it does is that it's, it's like, it's lost. It's like, it doesn't know what's this. Okay, so it just goes to this sentiment here and then it tries to, like output the possible token for sentiment, which is like positive or negative based on the typical distribution. So it just ignored, like you need to output full and bar. Yeah, so this, are, uh, this is just an example to show that if we were to just change the tokens randomly, okay, you, you, may not, you may not get it to work because it disrupts the semantic meaning here. Okay, so Terry so asked how about GPT-4, right? Glad you asked that. Okay, so all right, let's, let's talk about Lama 2 first. Lama 2, um, is very, very similar to ChatGPT. So you can see that actually ChatGPT and Llama 2 is very similar performance. Like, is it even makes the same mistakes? Like, look at that, <laughs> positive. Okay, here is, um, here they, because of RLHF, they say it's difficult to classify, you know? Yeah, but typically both make the kind of same mistakes and it still doesn't work. Okay, so now GPT-4. Okay, so you ask because you think GPT-4 can work, right? And yeah, it works. Yeah. <laughs> so this um arbitrary token thing, perhaps it can still work for um for larger models, all right. So you look at this, it managed to classify this LMs are the full thing ever, is classified as negative. So so that's great. It managed to associate this full to negative. And 
for this case on the right here, it managed to find the pattern like bar to full and then full to bar. It managed to do that. So great job to GPT-4. I, I, I love GPT-4. Yeah. So if you have been using chat GPT, you probably can't get that great a performance, right? But the authors of this paper, they use text DaVinci 003, which is like closer to chat GPT than to GPT-4. So a lot of the experiments they do will suffer from the same flaws that uh, chat GPT have. And um, so this makes me cast doubts on some of the results that they can get, all right? I mean, sure, you can you, you can randomly map the tokens, but you can't just anyhow randomly map. There must be, there, there's, some, there's some semantic meanings in, in the tokens that cannot be neglected, all right? And yeah, this example that I did, this experiment that I did kind of shows that, you know, the semantic meaning is still there. Okay, but there's some window of hope here. I mean, if you want to do this kind of random mapping thing and uh, like arbitrary rule finding, GPD-4 seems to, to be able to work to a limited extent. So uh, that could also explain why, like in my up challenge, uh, when I did with chat GPT versus GPD-4, uh, chat GPT gets almost all wrong, all right? But GPT-4 is able to associate the higher level order patterns that is beyond the semantic meaning, right? So that's, that's an encouraging sign. All right, so next is, does in-context learning work for any label, all right? So we see over here, we swap the labels, okay? So previously I said the movie is great, it's positive, right? Now I say it's negative. So this is directly against what the LM has been trained on. So it's like giving it wrong advice, like giving it wrong examples. So let's take a look what each of them uh, does. Like GPT, chat GPT says positive, okay? So the examples here, okay? So if you can treat this as retrieval augmented generation or like a uh, few short learning, um, the examples fail to override the semantic priors of positive and negative. So it goes back to the training distribution, okay? If, if it had overwritten it, you would have seen this as negative, right? Same thing for GPT-4. In fact, GPT-4 does something quite funny, all right? It told me that I was wrong. It told me that my examples here are wrong. You see, look at this. Negative, negative, negative. Over here, they tell me movie was great. Instead of negative, they say positive. So GPT-4, instead of just outputting the answer, GPT-4 tries to correct me. So yeah, that's, that's quite interesting because um, it shows that it understood what I'm trying to say. So, you know, if you want to do this kind of like few short learning, uh, this makes a very key point for like businesses and for people who are using uh, GPT. You shouldn't give it stuff counter to the in-context examples. Oh, sorry, to, to the training distribution. So like, for example, if the training distribution, like after the letter A, is a space bar, right? If you change like this to be A becomes a dash, you know, like it will take a long time for it to relearn this because the distribution that it has known is after every A is a space bar. Okay. So like similar to this, like it knows that this kind of phrasing is like a positive phrasing. It's very hard to override this sentiment with just a few examples. All right. Lama 2 uh, is the same as ChatGPT, so it doesn't work as well. So I think this example is quite interesting because it goes to show that if you counter the flow of the of the stuff that it has been trained on, or of, of the stuff that the LM has been trained on, if you counter it, you expect to get quite bad results for your own use case. So your use case has to be very, very similar to that of the distribution that was used in training as far as possible. Okay, so if you want to be a prompt engineer, Try to keep this in mind because um, this is probably the way to go for prompt engineering. You need to try to think what, like if you're using uh, GPT, uh, you have to think like what OpenAI might have used for their training and try to match that okay, so that you have an easier time doing the prompt engineering. All right. Okay, Terry, what do you say? Um, you said that you can probably inform the LM you have your own set of definitions. Oh, definitely. Yeah, so uh, what Terry said is correct. So, you can ask it at the top here. You can say that uh, ignore, uh, use the new definition of negative and positive as shown in the following examples. You can give a caveat here 
And I think this might be able to solve the problem. I haven't tried this out, but uh, what Terry said makes sense. Like you can inform the LM that the example that you are doing right now is counter to what it has known before. So uh, GPT-4 or ChatGPT is quite good at using context okay, to control the flow of the generation. So if you context, in, in your context, you mentioned that this is very different from what you have trained on. It, it, it would work. Yeah, I, I agree with this approach. Yeah. But this doesn't change my main point. My main point is that if you want to do stuff using an LM, it is best to go with the flow of the training distribution. If not, uh, even few short learning may not be able to solve it. Right. Okay, so very quickly, let me just go through this uh, wrong semantics paper. So this paper was a paper by Ite. All right. Um, I mean, su supervised by Ite, I guess. I, I quite like this paper. It shows that um, semantically wrong labels can affect the model's performance. So they did in-context learning with flip labels. Okay, very similar to what you saw earlier. Like the movie was great. I, I, I say negative, All right? So with flip labels, it affected performance a lot. Okay, so what they did was that they trained the model using flip labels. So like, that means it needs to be like, sorry, they fine tune the model using flip labels. So if the model knows like that um, you need to learn this like new meaning, uh, then what will happen is that in the test set, it will classify all of them wrongly. Okay. Because the test set uses the correct meaning. Okay. But we kind of fine tune the model with the flip learning, uh, sorry, flip labels. And basically they show that like, Small language models ignore the flip labels, okay? So everything is semantic bias. Large models can override semantic bias. So actually this is quite in line with what we saw with like GPT, like over here with a label like who and by managed to classify it. Then over here it managed to classify as well, um, but it didn't do so well for this flip label task. So um, there are results over here that large models can override semantic bias. bias. I believe is this is true, right? But you kind of need a much larger model, right? Probably because when you do the self attention, you know you need to go beyond the semantic level. You need to go at the token level, uh, then you can do this. So um, they compared a few in this paper called larger language models do in context learning differently. They compared a few models, and so as I said earlier in the test set, okay, although in the fine tuning part, all right, they flip the labels, so the model needs to learn the wrong relation, like positive become negative. But in the test set, okay, they use back the original labels. So if you get below 50% accuracy, it means that, okay, it means that your fine tuning has learned something. If accuracy. Okay, this is quite a funny way of re representing results because, you know, in, in uh, deep learning papers, you would typically like, typically like to see higher accuracy. Like state of the art always compete to see who has the highest accuracy. This paper, they try to compete who does the lowest accuracy. So <laughs> that's quite funny, all right? So in this paper, you realize that like stuff like instruct GPT, uh, codex, like only with the larger models can you like go below 50%. Uh, GPT-3, um, it didn't really go below, all right? Maybe not large enough. Okay. It's funny that I'm saying GPT-3 is not large enough, but in today's age, with 70 billion LAMA2 models, uh, over 100 billion GPT-4, right? Like GPT three is small. <laughs> oh man, time time flies. Yeah, GPT three just came out a few years ago, and now it's considered small. But yeah, larger models like Palm. Yeah, Palm is like five hundred forty billion. Yeah, you look at the, the thing down here, five four zero billion. Right, it can override a bit of semantic bias. Okay, so um, perhaps another interesting thing that they found out is that if you do instruction tuning, all right you actually strengthen the semantic bias because after you do the um, input label mappings, okay, you actually, um, what, what happens is that you perform worse at this benchmark. Like the more examples you give for instruction fine tuning, the, the more it cannot ignore the semantic bias. So this is uh, interesting because it means that like, the semantic bias are strengthened from instruction fine-tuning. Kind of makes sense because instruction fine-tuning is kind of using semantic 
um, instructions to the model, like translate English to German, you know? So it tends to focus more on the semantic bias. So this experiments that are done by this paper shows that the semantic bias are hard to ignore. Okay, larger models might be able to ignore it to a limited extent, you can see over here. But generally, semantic bias are there and it can't be overridden that easily. Okay, if you really want to ignore all semantic bias, you should use like tokens that probably have no meaning. Okay, so what what are, what what are these tokens? You probably need to train from scratch the large language model. If you want to do like a, an arbitrary pattern recognizer, yeah, may, maybe you should just train it from scratch. You shouldn't use like a pre-trained model because a pre-trained model will come with semantic bias, right? Okay, before I move on to the experiments in this paper, I would just like to pause here for a quick while uh, in case you have any questions you'd like to ask on whatever I've covered earlier. Okay, if, if there's nothing, um, I'll just carry on, uh, but feel free to just type in the chat if you, if you have anything. All right, so the first is the sequence transformation. Uh, as what I mentioned earlier, this is just to test whether the model can understand, uh, discover and apply rules. So. In this case, we want to map like the most common color, like green, into this thing here. We want to map it into like this, this pixel over here. So same thing for this thing. So this is the rule. Okay, the rule is not verbalized in text. The rule must be discovered by the large language model. So you can see my like up video on how I did this. Um, I tried to get the large language model to, to associate to some rules that I've given it. Okay, so. Large language models are able to do this association. And by large language models, I actually mean uh, GPT-4 because ChatGPT doesn't do this well at all. GPT-4 can infer like this kind of rules provided it's quite similar to the rules that you have given it. right? And how does the large language model view pictures? Okay. Uh, Multimodal large language models right, can view pictures. Uh, I mean, there are a few ways to view pictures. Uh, one way is to pass it through some uh, image processing module, uh, like for example, a CNN. I mean, more recently, people use uh, vision transformers. Uh, I don't quite like vision transformers for reasons I mentioned before, like it like, cuts the image at arbitrary points <laughs> to form the different squares. Yeah. So uh, over here for the arc challenge, we don't need to use a, um, an image converter because like this arc challenge, honestly, if you use a CNN, it's not going to give you that great results. Um, it's very different from the kind of distribution you've seen in like MNIST or sci-fi. These are very discreet and very like, very, very elaborate and uh, intentional placement of this squares. You can't really abstract it away. Okay? Because if you abstract it away, you have problems reconstructing it at the output. So we want a very precise representation of the image. And so what we can do is we can just output it as a series of tokens like that. So like, for example, the empty token, or basically the black color is given as token zero. So you can see that this black square here is given as token zero. And then like this green square is given as token one. I'm just giving you an example of uh, how this can be represented. Uh, of course, you don't have to use 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. You can use A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yep. You can use any token. But this is the view that is typically done if we want to convert it to like maybe a JSON. Like this is how it's done for the up challenge. Okay. And this is the view that um this paper uses to see whether up challenge can it be done like that's uh, using input-output in this kind of grid format, can it already get the pattern? So let's see what happens, right? So they did this out of the box, okay? They used text DaVinci and got 85 out of 800, correct. Okay, that's, that's quite amazing, okay? Because like in my experiments with like my various abstract views and stuff, I got 50 correct out of 111, all right? So 85 out of 800 is like really good, given that this is just like, taking input to output and just asking the LM to predict output. Okay, uh, uh, but I couldn't replicate their results on chat GPT, all right? Some, some of their results work too well, all right? Even GPT-4 cannot, cannot solve the problems, but just can solve. So um, I suspect there's some data leakage in the way they tested this, all right? That means um, maybe text C 3 perhaps has seen some of the up challenge uh, input output. If not, like I, I don't see how it can get so many correct. Okay, but but that aside, okay, this is just my suspicion that there's some data leakage. Okay. Um they showed that if you do a random mapping of this 0, 1 to 9 into like weird tokens, 
like over here they map into Chromebook, Swang. Okay, you realize that these um words when put together makes no sense, right? Like shabby chef, fail, sim, all this like they, they don't really seem to make a very logical sentence. So perhaps that's why this can still work. Okay, because the moment you can make a logical sentence like I am a student, that kind of thing, you know, sometimes the semantic priors will over override the kind of the sequence uh, that you want. So yeah, it's best if these tokens contain very little information. Okay. So you can see that look at this dip in performance. If you if you just use 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, you get 52 up problems. Okay, that's around the same as my 50 problems that I saw. Across five different random alphabets, you saw 43.6 problems. Can y'all see um can y'all see something here? There's a drop in performance if you use random tokens, right? So um rather than saying that there's a drop in tokens when you use random tokens, the authors have chosen to say that it retains some performance when you use random tokens. Okay, so yeah, there's no token invariance. Okay, get this straight, right? There's there's no token invariance. You change the token to change the way the model interprets it, right? Um, but their findings showed that the token invariance can help with in-context learning for new tasks. Yeah, I think if let's say the model has not seen an arbitrary combination of tokens before, like this, like A B B A B A B D gives you like one. A, B, C gives you zero, like if it ends with D gives you one, you know, that kind of stuff is probably probably not in the training set. But um, yeah, if you use tokens like this that carry not much semantic meaning, yes, token invariance can help with new tasks. I agree with that. But the moment you use tokens that have too much semantic meaning, like positive, negative, like I, I put this here, tokens with too much semantic meaning, Yeah, if you use tokens like this, as what we shown in the experiments earlier, you will have problems. <laughs> okay, you will have a lot of problems because it's very hard to override the semantic bias. But if you use tokens like this that carry very little semantic meaning, let me just put here little semantic meaning. Then I can see that um, whatever they did in this paper is possible. All right. So, and uh, another thing, thing to note if you are trying to implement this paper for your own work is that uh, if you are doing this arbitrary uh, token matcher, you should make the tokens be separated by a space or a delimiter. A uh, delimiter just means a uh, separation between words. Over here in the arc challenge, the delimiter is a comma. Okay, I went to look, look, look at the code for the arc because I myself interested how they get such good results. Okay, yeah, the delimiter is a comma. Then the row delimiter is a is a slash n. So uh, in token is a comma, the row is a slash n. So you will get something like this, like this over here yeah so why do we do this okay. again we have to go into some fundamentals of the large language model we do this because the large language model the way tokens are formed all right is by this process called byte pair encoding and uh, byte pair encoding what is it does is that it just takes two adjacent letters and then it sees whether it's like it's common in the sequence like for example you have this like a b c d e f a a uh sorry b a a b a a b c c a a something like that like if you have a sequence like that all right what you might do is because a appears so many times okay or maybe let's make it easier let's let's just do a b a b a b a b yeah because a b appears so many times you might change a b into a new token called g so it can be like that g c d e f a and g g g g g so you can do this iteratively you group more common occurrences of letters together to form new tokens. So if you were to put your random tokens like side by side, um, there's a that there's a small chance, okay, that your tokenizer might group them as one token. Okay, so I I experimented before in the in the GPT four like hex is one token, hex hex is another token, hex 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 is another token. So if you were want uh if you were to use hex as your way to represent a certain token. Uh, when you do hex hex hex, you know you don't get the i you, you basically don't get three times of this, okay? You will get just get this hex 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 as a single token. So this is quite important. Uh, if you are using this for prompt engineering, because you do need to take note that um certain words might be, uh, certain letters might be grouped together. Um, like I give you another example, like if you want the LM to reverse like, reverse. Abacus, right? Something like that. Like if 
you don't give abacus as like space in between or a delimiter in between, it cannot sense that all these letters are are unique and distinct, and then you cannot do the reversing properly. You can go and try this out. Like you want to reverse a word, you should put space or you should put like a comma between each of the letters. If not, it's very hard for the large language model to know. Okay, you can also try this out, like count the number of E's in like elementary. Right? If you don't put like spaces in between here, if you don't put spaces in between here, it's almost uh certain that GPT will get it wrong. All right. So it cannot count letters that well. And why is that the case? This all goes because of the tokenizer. Yeah, quite interesting, right? I, I don't know whether you all know of this before I, I talked about it, but the tokenizer itself plays a huge role in how the large language model understands what you put in, right? The, of course, the other way that we can do this kind of tokenization is to just directly embed these token numbers into the input sequence. So if we can embed these token numbers, uh, what this means is that, like for example, I have this sequence here, A, B, C, D, E. Then I just do a manual encoding. So my manual encoding tokens will be like that. Instead of A, B, C, D, E, I encode it as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yeah, so the token number will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So instead of letting the instead of letting the tokenizer do the job, like I, I don't want to group like A, B together, I ensure that because I do manual letter by letter encoding, I ensure that each of these letters are represented by a unique token. So these are the two ways in general to avoid the tokenizer like from chunking your letters unintentionally. You either put a delimiter or space, which is the first method, or you manually encode that letter as a number. Okay. So you perform the job of like maybe the big token encoder. You just go through the whole text, take each letter and you encode it to a number. Okay. Any questions for this so far? Okay. I went through a bit uh, more in detail here because this is actually very key to their paper. They, they use this in all their experiments. All right, so uh, there's another kind of uh, method that they did. All right, they did this thing called graphs detection. So on the left, you can see this is like their gripper arm in Google. All right, so what they want to do is they want to convert this into a low dimensional, low resolution image like that. Okay, and what is done is that you have typically, uh, like for example, in this case, you have a certain gripper arm. All right, you can see that there's a shadow over here, right? Yeah, so the gripper arm is actually over here. So it's this square here. So you want to predict like where the gripper arm is. So this is a three, six, like column three, row six. Yeah, so you want to predict the position of the gripper arm based on the image. Okay, so how you do this is just by looking at some patterns of this shape here and try to identify the shadow maybe. Yeah, so that is uh, actually quite a difficult problem. So this is one way, this is task one, predict what coordinate the gripper arm is. And then now we have task two. All right, task two is that you have this, you shift the red plate to the green plate, okay? So over here, this is the red plate, right? Okay, in all cases, I shift my red plate to the green plate here. So I want to do a next state prediction of where the, what the image should be. So you can see in this image, everything is the same. Less this part here, this red plate has been shifted to this part here. And I want to predict the pixel combinations. Like everything else is largely similar, maybe except for, for this thing over here. This thing has changed. Okay, after you shift the red plate, and this thing has changed also. Yeah. So um it's not that easy, all right, <laughs> to do this prediction because uh it involves doing predictions in your state space. All right. So um yeah, I, I quite like how they tried to use large language models to do this. Uh, task one, I think this is perfectly fine. Okay, because task one involves like finding the gray, gray squares and infer position of grip of grip arm. Yeah, I, I think the task one is perfectly fine. You, you can do that because like that's more or less an image kind of problem. You try to uh, infer the position of the shadow, you know. Then you can see the shadow area is the darker one. So maybe you can see that. You know, this part here maybe is the gripper arm because it's near the dark shadows. Yeah, it's a pattern kind of thing. So I, I agree with task one. Task two, I think is a bit too hard, okay? Because like you are trying to predict the state transition. 
you know, predicting the state transition is like predicting the up challenge final answer is very difficult. Okay, it's probably easier to predict the actions, which is like what I did for the up challenge. So you predict the rules use, and then you just perform those rules in like a simulation. Okay, so um, you can predict these actions, and then in your simulation, and what I propose is to use memory to kind of infer what will happen. Okay, that could be used to predict the output. I don't think you should use. Okay, let me just put here. My opinion is you should not use LMs to predict the next state. Right, it's too complicated. Okay, you should use simulators or memory to do that. Okay, but I mean they they did try to use this here. Yeah, okay, I don't really see um very good results for this, but. I, I think this is an interesting idea that they tried to do here. Okay, and you can see like they map different colors to different token numbers. Yeah. So this is like pretty much similar to like this up challenge mapping. Very, very similar. But they apply it for a robotics domain. So interesting idea. I agree with task one, but not so much for task two for the reasons I explained earlier. Okay, next up, uh, we have sequence completion. So what this sequence completion does is that you are trying to complete the sequence based on your initial pattern. So like initially your pattern is like that. Like maybe in terms of tokens, I mean in terms of text, it'll be something like um 50, 51, 53, then after it goes down again, 51, 50, 49, 47, maybe like that. 49, 50, 51, 53. Yeah. So 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 you have like this thing, like the amplitude of your wave, you could put it as a stream of numbers, and then you try to predict like what numbers will this be, right? So uh, one way to encode this number will be to like directly from this number become the token number, <laughs> that, that's possible. Or you can just map these numbers to like arbitrary tokens. Okay, is, is, is the performance will change based on how you map it. Uh, my preference is that you map it to like letters like A, B, C, D, E, like with no not much meaning, yeah. That that's that's better than you just randomly say, okay, this is going to be token fifty. This is going to be token fifty one. I guess you don't know what tokens these are. Like if if the token is something like positive or negative, you know, it might affect the meaning of the entire thing. Okay, so you can see that this is the error, and uh, you can see that the larger models make better prediction with low error rates. Okay, so the larger models are to the right. Okay, you can see that large models make very little error. I believe this is based on mean square error. Okay. And you can see, like, even for this very complicated extrapolation stuff, like it goes higher and higher magnitude, the large models also show a better performance. Uh, this one is a decreasing magnitude problem. Large models show a good performance as well. So uh, they also showed that conditioning on more. Okay. So, like, instead of just conditioning on maybe the first 10 points, I condition on the first 20 points. You condition on more context, you extrapolate better, okay? Because more information given to the model, this is actually quite good. You know, if you are trying to do a time series prediction, you can just maybe do a, a large language model based prediction. I mean, the result shown that it's not bad, right? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I agree with this use case because I think that uh, large language models are great to extrapolate patterns. So um, there's this thing called the 1D up. And I'm not sure if you heard of it. So the one D up challenge is the you know the last the abstraction and reasoning corpus earlier was a two dimensional grid. There's a one dimensional up challenge where you basically do manipulations on like a row of pixels, and one D up challenge the GPT four like can do like up to ninety percent of the task pretty well. Yeah, uh, one D okay positional embeddings in a transformer I think it has been done quite well. Okay, two D not really, but one D positional embeddings very good. So you should try to convert most problems into a 1D problem as much as possible. And this is a 1D problem. So sequence completion, I would say LMs are not bad to, to use for sequence completion. And to generate synthetic data based on an earlier distribution, no, why not? If you can express your data, you quantize it, express it as tokens, sure, use it to do your sequence completion. Okay. So my view is that LMs are not that great with numbers. Okay, so if you can abstract it to some abstraction space, like over here, you abstract it into like the token space, like some arbitrary token that uh, hopefully does not, does not have that much semantic meaning. Sure, sequence completion, I think LMs are suitable to do it. Yeah, so any, any questions on this?
All right, now to the most interesting part. All right, this is the sequence improvement part. Uh, so sequence improvement is basically to see whether or not the large language model can learn, all right? Because, you know, normally large language models, they don't really learn, you know? They only have a certain sequence. Uh, sorry, they only have a certain, like, pre-training. Then they try to just, like, output the, the generated tokens. But can we use it to do some form of reinforcement learning and improve on, like, the path or the trajectory taken by an agent? So... This is called sequence improvement, and uh, this is actually based heavily off this architecture called a decision transformer. So uh, what is a decision transformer? So a decision transformer is an interesting way to model a reinforcement learning problem as a, an action prediction problem. Okay, what do I mean? Okay, suppose we are playing like this Atari game. This, this is called Pong, all right? So you're controlling the pedal move up and down, right? Let's say that initially I want you to get 100 reward. So I, I want your agent to say, yes, I want you to get a lot of reward, like 100 reward. And then like, I give you your current state, which is like this, this image here, like a CNN state um, embedded in the transformer, right? So there's a separate embedding for state embedding, there's an action embedding, and there's a reward embedding. So all this will be mapped through some like MLP layer, multi-layer perceptual layer, and then mapped into a common embedding space. Okay, so I have this embedding layer. I use a transformer to predict the next action. All right. So after I predict the next action, this action will come here. And then after that, I'll because after I take the action, I will get my next reward. So my this my this reward at time t is the reward at time t minus one minus the environment reward that has given me at the last step. Yeah, so okay, these are some, some details. Like, so let's say I got a reward of one for hitting that pedal. Now, maybe I'll get a, uh, okay, over here they condition on 21, all right? So let's say initially I get, instead of 100 reward, I get a reward of 22. Yeah, so initially it's 22 reward. Now I, I will have like 21 because the environment has given me a reward of one. After I take this action, I get a reward of one. I subtract off this overall reward and I get, I condition on reward 21. So the idea is when I condition on this total rewards that I should get from this sequence, I can take the appropriate actions to achieve that reward. Okay, a very nice idea, I would say. Like I quite like the idea of predicting actions because uh, in my theory of um, intelligence, I believe intelligence all comes from predicting, predicting actions. Yeah, if you can predict actions well, you can if essentially like, make decisions so action prediction and not state prediction is the most important okay because state prediction we can have some internal world models like through memory or something to do the state prediction but you definitely need to do action prediction in order to make decisions like what to eat today you need to choose like chicken rice or duck rice you need to make the action okay and they condition this action on the total reward so th that's a very interesting idea right like just from changing this total reward you can ask the large language model to perform like an idiot or perform like a pro. You say, I want a reward of zero. Then the large language model will go ahead and miss all the balls in, in the Pong game. You say, I want the uh, reward of 22. Then it will play like a pro. Okay, uh, That's the ideal, all right? That's the ideal. But if you look at the decision transformer paper, you realize that um, this is like what you will see here. So imagine this is your predicted reward. This is your reward and this is the actual reward actual reward okay let me just write it out here so this actual reward and this is like the reward you ask okay in general uh the trend is like almost linear so it, it gives you the actual reward but there's this cutoff if you look at the paper there's this cutoff here this cutoff is the cutoff of the best known sample reward so like based on what you have given it to train on the best expert demonstration goes on you here. Typically, what happens after that is you ask for a higher reward, it will like, <laughs> it goes down, right? So what, what this means is that it uh, doesn't really um, generalize to, to learn beyond that of given samples. Yeah, uh, this kind of method generally just does uh, mimicking of the trajectories you have fed it, right? So this is Transformers, nice idea. But conditioning on reward alone, okay, doesn't really help you to learn like how to get that reward, right? Typically, it doesn't really go beyond um, the expert demonstration provided to it. 
So yeah, how can we use large language models now? Okay, in like a token way, okay, to do this kind of sequence improvement. So let's uh, see what the authors did. So um, I'm going to talk about quite heavily on this reinforcement learning stuff here, because this next part is typically reinforcement learning. I'm going to talk about this. Uh, okay, can I just check uh, any of you here have heard of this thing called the cut pole? You just raise your hand if you have. Any of you has, have heard of this name called cut pole? Okay, so you has uh, the rest. Can I assume that you all haven't heard of it? Okay, because I, I'll, I'll, I'll cover more in detail if, if you haven't. Okay, so what is this cut pole thing? All right. So the cut pole is basically is a very traditional control problem. Okay, imagine you have this pole. Okay, let me, let me like this pen is the pole. You have a pole like that and you want to balance it. So this finger over here is the cut. So if I want to balance it, I need to only move the cut either left or right. And then I try to balance it as long as possible. So every second that I balance or every time step, I get a reward of one. The moment that the pole drops down below, beyond a certain angle, zero, reward zero. So um, I mean that episode will end. So the idea is I want to train a system such that this cut can know based on the velocity and the pole angle. Okay, of course, there are other stuff. So there's also cut position and cut velocity. Yeah, um, based on this uh, four states over here, they reduce it to just two, all right? Based on these four states in the cut pole problem, how am I going to make the cut move left or right? Right. So, like for example, here, like action one can be moving left. All right. And action two can be moving right. And over here, the state is uh, like a normalized view. Okay. Of, yeah, of basically like 45, 45. Yeah. So, this is the way that um, this is done. All right. So, they just basically pass in the state as a number. Okay, not uh exactly uh great here because like you kind of need to encode it to a token. Uh. You, you shouldn't just pass it as a 45 or 50 like that. So um over here they just pass this whole thing here as text, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So this is something that I think could be improved. You you should just embed this 45 or 50 into a, a into a token. All right. So this state here is like the pole angle and the velocity. So like typically you can solve cut pole using an if else statement. Uh, like if the pole tilts over to the left. Okay, if the pole tilts over to the left, anyone want to guess? Should you move to the left or should you take action one or two? If the pole is tilting to the left, how should you stabilize the pole? Should you take action one or take action two? Yeah, I mean you can just type your answer in the chat. Yeah, that's yeah, action one, yeah. So this is uh this is typically an if else statement. I mean, I, I tried using if else statement, you can solve the problem already. Like, not, not to belittle RL, but this is actually solvable using if else statement. You, if, if the pole is tilted to the left, move cut left. That's all. Okay. So, actually, I, I was thinking of writing a paper on this before. Like, if I could just embed like common sense logic <laughs> into this kind of problems, can I just saying that if the pole tilted to left, move cut left, then I just feed in the observations. Uh, can I solve it? Yeah. So, yeah. So you said action magnitude is important. Okay, in the cut pole environment, there's no magnitude here. There's only one or, there's only left or right for each time step. Yeah, but if you are making a, a continuous cut pole kind of thing, you can have a magnitude for your force for your cut. But in, in this case, this cut pole only has left or right. And no op, uh, there's also a no op. Okay, but over here we just, um, say left or right only. Uh, no op means like um, you don't take any action, like you, you don't move. Yeah, but um, typically couple we we have to move. Uh, we either move left or move right. So based on what you move, you get your next state, and then you take another action, you get your next state, and so on. Okay, so this is the total reward we get. So you can see that this is like the rewards to go. Our next state, then you predict the next action, then the next state, then you predict the next action. Okay, what we are missing here is prob probably like the rewards to go here. So uh, if we are doing it in like uh in a sequential manner, we can we can predict the next action first, then use it to output the next rewards to go, use the simulator to output the state, and then you can predict the next action again. So typically when you do it in an iterative process, you can do that. Uh, but in this case, what they did was they just generate the whole sequence out totally. 
So like, for example, if I want to get a perfect run of 200, I can give it like the starting state of 45, 50. And then like ask LM to generate the rest. So the RM will be like the simulator will simulate the next state, simulate the next actions. Okay, again, this is where it fails, you see, like because in like my learning class is low, I demonstrate that next state prediction is bad. Okay, using LM, yeah, or, or using like uh neural networks. We don't do next state predictions very well using this kind of approach. Like stuff, like um, there's this paper that uh DeepMind is one of the DeepMind papers. I think it's Dreamer. Yeah, it's called Dreamer V3. I mean, there are three versions of it: V1, V2, V3. They tried to do next state prediction using neural networks. They take super long to learn, right? They take like billions of iterations to learn how to mine a diamond in in Minecraft. Right, then Voyager can do this without using that millions. They just use like 2,000 iterations. Yeah, so neural networks are not very good for next state predictions. So you should generally use an external simulator or external kind of like, my method is using memory. So I'm still working on it. But once it's done, it will based on what memory you have and kind of like extrapolate what state you should be. Okay, but one key idea is, I agree is that you should predict actions. So your action prediction is key to learn representations. Okay. And yeah, so this is yeah. how the yeah, sorry, any yeah, you want to say something? Yeah, question. Yeah. So 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 does this decision transformer works well here? Because you just made a comment that neural networks is poor in doing this next action prediction. Ah, yes. So in the decision transformer paper the state is given by a simulator. So if you look over here, what the network is doing is that it's just predicting the action. Action will be fed into a simulator, okay? That will give you the reward that you update the returns. Like based on the reward you get here, you minus off the reward that you got in the previous state. So like initially was maybe like 22. Let's say your this action give you a reward of one, okay? Then you can update your reward to go to be 21, okay? And then like rewards to go means the rewards that you want to get until the end of the episode from that point. Right. Then we have this state over here. This state itself is given by simulator. Yeah. Okay, so, so you are saying uh neural network is actually it can do a decent job if you flood uh external uh, okay. simulator. In this case, the state is not given by a neural network. Ah, I see. So just now your comment is um when you use the neural network to also model the state, not just to predict the action. Yes, uh which then is the, it's very bad. Which is the case for this uh, for the couple example they use in the paper. The neural uh, network uh, predicts the state action state is action state, it predicts everything. So I'm saying that this right. is not the way to be. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but another question. Yeah. Uh, okay, you you can you can use um, do you have any other comment? No, no, you can continue your question. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so the second question is, um, can you go back to the previous slide? Oh, decision transformer, is it? Yeah, sure. Yes. So, so it, it looks to me, it looks like, um, so you can think of the entire sequence of uh, reward state and action uh, couple as like a series, right? I don't know if it's, uh, Time series, I can can we think of it that way? Uh yeah, yeah, sure. I mean it, okay. It, it, okay. Yeah, re rewards in time, uh, yeah. First reward or uh, state in time, yeah. You okay. 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 So this is a sequence of data. So um uh, but but typically in uh MDP formulation, right? We don't really care the previous what happens before the current state. So so but here it looks like if we if the transformer is trying to model this uh, uh state action reward uh sequence as a time series, so which means that I I think it kind of matters to this tra decision transformer what what the historical sequence is, right? Yes. So um you can treat the earlier part of the sequence as your like your your context because you will ground like how what action you will take next. Yeah, so my, so I think a natural question would be uh if this matters and how to what extent it matters compared to a typical MDP formation. Oh, it's much better. I I mean 
the typical MDP formulation is uh like you assume that the earlier states don't affect what what you need is just the current yeah. state. Yeah. 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 So yeah. MDP. MDP, you only need to know you are in state one in order to make the decision. Okay, but this may not be true. Okay, MDP or Markov decision process um, assumes independence of like your state transitions from earlier states. So you just only need to know that character. Like for example, a bot game, like a chess game, you just need to know how the bot looks like. You don't need to know the sequence of moves earlier. I mean, to a limited extent, unless you are doing the, you know, the king capture, then you cannot do more than three times, you know. Yeah. Apart from that, you don't need the earlier states. So this um is actually not a very good assumption for most real life cases. All right, I I don't like this actually. I don't like my decision process. I agree I with think, you. Yeah. It it looks like it's oversimplifying things. Yeah, because uh most real life cases the history does matter. Yeah. So yes. Over here, this is one good thing about decision transformers. No need MDP because you are modeling the whole sequence of actions and reward um state and actions from the start of the episode all the way in now. You have the whole history condition. So when you predict the next action, okay, when you predict the next action. You condition on all earlier states and actions. So this is one thing I like about decision transformers, is that um you don't need to rely on the Markov decision process for, for holding. You you can just use the entire sequence of the history of states and actions to predict your next action. And and there are empirical evidence that this actually works better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, decision I transformers work better than RL. I see. Yeah. Okay, but good um, as much as I praise decision transformers right now, you will see in the later slide that I don't agree with one thing in decision transformers. <laughs> and that thing is reward. Okay? All right, we shall see. Okay. Yeah. I don't think you need reward to, to improve. So this is very controversial. Uh, recent studies in the brain have also shown that like the reward pathway actually utilizes other pathways in the brain. Okay. So I believe that uh, through intelligence, you don't have to use reward to condition your, your, your actions. You can learn it from conditioning on something else. Okay, I'll, I'll talk more about this, but let's talk about what they did for the paper first. So basically given a past series of, so what they used was they just, they just used the maximum, the best few, best few trajectories. Okay, they fit as much as they can in the context. So I read, look at their code, their context is up to 1030 tokens. Okay, because they're using a smaller version, the text that you see. Okay, if you use ChatGPT, you can put more tokens definitely. They put the best few trajectories. Uh, then after that, they like maybe ask like for a trajectory that hits two hundred or or hits a higher number. Yeah, to 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 like generate the sequence out. And Sorry for the interruption. Oh yes. Uh, I don't understand when we don't need to use MDP while the, there is another action and state there we used to be. Okay, why is there a need to use MDP if you don't use history, right? Okay, so it's like that. Uh, suppose this is my my state action graph. Like this is state one. It goes to it. You you can take an action. So so this is like if you traverse through like, uh, a pathway of states. Okay, this each state could be like maybe the couple on the left, couple on the right, you know, the pole on the left or right. You take a certain action, you go to a certain state. Okay, so um traditional reinforcement learning relies on this quite heavily because when you are making an action for a state like. Action equals to normally they will go through this policy function. Okay. And this is only conditioned on when you take action, you only know current current state. Usually in reinforcement learning, because of uh I think hardware limitations in the past, um, this is a rule uh, that you only use the current state you are in to make a decision of what you do. Like for example, if you look at, at this poll here. I only give you the poll like that at this position. I don't tell you how the poll looks like in the past. Okay, that's why there's a need for velocity and angle. You see, this captures some of the information of the earlier states. Like the velocity tells you how much the poll is going to move over time. All right, so this captures some of the information of the past states. But generally speaking, given just this poll angle and velocity, I don't need to know how the poll moved in the past. I don't need, I don't need to know whether the poll moved left or moved right. 
I just need to know how the pole looks like now in terms of like the velocity and the angle. I can make a meaningful prediction of how to stabilize the pole. So yeah, this is typical reinforcement learning. Uh, there's a Markov decision process assumption here so that we can simplify the problem of predicting actions by just performing some of just performing some form of function okay to select an action based on the current state yeah uh, did i answer your question okay thank you actually yeah. can i make one more comment here yeah so so i think yeah here like for example right if uh so I'm I'm trying to to make a case for why the his, historical uh data or sequence matters here. So let's say if your sensor is only able to detect the position and the velocity, then which means that you, you are not able to detect the acceleration of the of the card pole, right? Given the current velocity and the position, it's hard to for you to actually make a well well informed decision if you do not know the current acceleration. So then the past uh, the past sequence of the um of the of the data actually can inform you, give you an educated guess on what is the actual acceleration. Right. But if yeah. you know the acceleration, then you don't really need the historical data. Correct. Right. Yeah. So uh, like if you are familiar with like papers like DQ and DQ networks, you realize that this kind of decision transformers also based off that. This state is actually not just one state like that. It's actually like four separate slices of states and then they concatenate all these four images together and pass it through a CNN. And these four states is like the four pass frames. Like let's say this is like the ball like that. Maybe the next frame will be like you move the pedal a bit, the ball moves a bit to the, to the left here. And maybe your pedal move a bit, and your ball move like here, and then th this last state will be like here, the pedal and the ball together. So typically, in uh, like when you do like Atari games, like usually take four slices of the last four time steps, concatenate them as one state. Okay, why? Okay, you might be wondering why they do this. Um, so that you know you can actually do um like based on the states itself you can actually do like the just using the earlier states you can just predict the action okay um I'm and and this already partially breaks the the MDP assumption right because strictly speaking you only have to only have one snapshot of the of what is going on here is like you have uh, like a subset of the sequence of action already. Yeah, um, I mean, it's still an MDP because like if this four snapshots can fully define a unique state and you don't need any of the earlier states, this is an MDP. It's just that um, your state will be very complicated because like initially, imagine if like you have, imagine you have 100 possibilities for one state. So if you have four states combined together, you have 100 about four possibilities. Yeah. So okay. So basically, what the decision transformer does is like extreme version of this, right? Yeah. So I can't remember because it's been a while that I look at the decision transformer paper. I can't remember whether this state is just one slice or concatenated part. I mean, they they I I I have a suspicion that it's concatenated, but you know, given the way the decision transformer is made, actually, there's no need to do the concatenation. Yeah. Exactly. I also feel yeah. like there's no need to do that. So it's like. It's not four snapshot, you have the entire history. Yeah, in decision transformer, you don't need to follow the MDP sequence. So it's quite likely that this state here might just be one slice. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm just saying that like in traditional reinforcement learning, in order to maintain the Markov decision property, they actually did stuff like this to try to incorporate information from earlier states into the current state. So they just have an expanded current state like this. Yeah. So I, I, I just illustrate this for Durama in, in case like, I mean, if you're not too familiar with reinforcement learning, this is what has traditionally been done. Yeah. So, okay, are we ready to move on? Yeah, it's good questions actually. Yeah, this helps us to think more about why certain things are done. Uh, so you got anything else to add? If not, I will, I will carry on. Okay. 
can let's move on. All right. So how did they do this cut hole prediction? Is basically taking the total reward and then you predict the whole list of. I mean, maybe total reward and then something like this. I mean, let's say I'm to get ninety eight like that. I give you this over here and then I ask the LM to generate the rest. So this is like a if you think of it as something like a sequence completion problem. Okay, except that I give you certain uh like ground truths over here. I, I give you certain context to reference. I mean, if you think about it, actually, this is also similar to memory, right? It's actually not, not the bad because you can refer those memories and adapt it to your current situation. So quite interesting, this idea, quite interesting. All right, but you can see the performance are not, it's not very good. Is it? So like you have different models here. The first 100 episodes are random, okay? And then after that, you see how long it takes to reach like 200. It takes almost 80 episodes with the largest model here. Right? It takes about 80 episodes here just to reach the highest trajectory. And a uh, couple is a simple problem. All right, so this LM method is not that great. Okay, and one reason is because, you know, it's very hard to simulate the next state. Uh, it's very, very hard to simulate the next state. So, uh, yeah, I, I think over here, maybe, oh, actually, I can't think of it. In their Jupyter notebook, they seem to do it one time set at a time. So maybe they maybe the criticism I had earlier is not valid. They actually predict the action only and then run the action through the simulator and then predict the next state. Then you just predict the next action. Okay, so I think you can scratch what I said earlier. Because I remember seeing the in the Jupyter notebook yesterday that um they actually run through the entire episode time step like in a for loop. So it's very likely that they did the decision transformer method. Just predict the action and then use the simulator to give you the, the state, then predict the action and so on. So, okay, granted they did that, okay, which is a great job for the authors. Granted they did that, <laughs> it still takes very long to learn. You look at this 80 episodes to learn how to balance a poll. Yeah. I mean, if I were to pass you a poll right now, I think you can balance it like within a minute. I should be able to learn how to balance it. It's, it's just too long to learn this. And this is my main gripe with uh, reinforcement learning methods. In order to learn a very simple thing like balancing a bowl, it takes forever, right? And yeah, I mean, as a comparison, one of the leading methods called proximal policy optimization. Okay, within 10 episodes, more or less can learn this. Okay, sometimes if I'm lucky, within the first episode, you learn it. Uh, within the first try, I learn already. So like one try is defined as a thousand time steps. Um, I mean, I, I this is using this thing called um sta stable RL. Oh no, I can't remember what, what name of the package is. Yeah, but basically within 10 episodes, you are more or less guaranteed that the PPO algorithm can learn this. So this is still quite far away from, from like the most performant reinforcement learning method. So it's not not that performant actually. So why? Why why is it? So let's analyze why why it took so long to learn. I mean, the idea is interesting. I quite like the idea of grounding on past experiences and then try to generate a new kind of sequence. I, I like this idea a lot. Okay. okay. They realized something in their results. They realized that if they've used the token zero for left and one for right, okay, the LM will default to sampling zero. Okay, so it's likely due to token specific prior. So what, what this means is a random mapping of tokens is a bad idea. Okay, so I don't know why they said that like you can still perform with random mapping of tokens. Is very is 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 wrong. It, it, the token semantic priors matter a lot. So they just did zero for left. You can see that the model keeps selecting zero, likely because zero keeps appearing in a lot of like data sets online. All right. So maybe this is why it's defaulting to zero. Okay. So instead of zero and one, they use one and two. Yeah. So this is the thing that uh right now. Uh, what they have been doing is to use that, all right? So I think this is something that uh, we need to keep in mind, okay? Because we can probably do this mapping well uh, with random tokens, if only the random tokens don't have the semantic priors. So very, very important to take note. If you were to choose your tokens, you better choose one that, that doesn't appear much in the online text, okay? Like you can choose like maybe a... I, I I don't know, choose a letter. I mean, I, I find that this kind of letters work pretty well if you want to do arbitrary stuff. I I I, I use this for the app challenge. 
yeah, this is my method. And uh, yeah, it worked better than using numbers. Okay, because if you use numbers, uh, LM things that you're trying to do addition or subtraction with it. Yeah, so using letters, I found that it works pretty well. All right. So another thing to take note is that if you were to pass the numbers directly for tokenization, you may not get a very good representation because you know if you're talking about the number line right like typically numbers in the number line like zero and one tend to appear together and zero and ten appear very far away All right and like same thing for here zero and minus ten okay if you use tokenization okay you may lose the magnitude meaning yeah, because when we go into the tokenized space, okay, we lose the meaning of like three plus three give you six, that kind of thing. Because the tokenized space for number three, okay, and number six may not be like the number six may not be double the magnitude of three in the embedding space. So you lose out stuff like that. And that's also why large language models don't do very well for math. Okay. The inherent tokenization for numbers is not there. All right. It's better to just use a number-based method rather than a large language model to do this kind of continuous control task, okay? Unless you can abstract the whole thing into a, a symbol. So like, for example, like pole tilts left, you can extract it into category A. Pole tilts right, you can extract it into category B. Then you associate the whole sequence of categories like that, A, B, A, A. You do away with all the numbers you extract into categories, the LM will likely work much better. And that's my that's my view actually. Yeah. Okay, so you, you said something. Um when input one zero, how does the LM know to tokenize as one zero ten or one and zero? I think the LM doesn't know. So the LM will basically based on the byte pair encoding and see whether or not like number 10 appears a lot in the training distribution. Uh, if it does, then 10 will be one symbol. So that's why I don't uh, think that you should put this whole thing. Uh, as you should map this whole thing into one symbol. You shouldn't use the tokenizer. Okay, you should map into a symbol yourself. <laughs> Don't use tokenizer because um the thing is if you were to use a tokenizer, you you are not guaranteed. Okay, that the number won't be split up into two. Right. I mean, if you think about it, like if we talk about stuff like hiking, you know, if they split hiking into like that hike and then in right. If you split into two tokens like that, still okay because like height is like noun and then ing is like verb, so can come can combine the meaning. But if you split one and zero like that, you lose the position of like one being a tens digit and zero being a ones digit. Yeah, so you know in the early GPT days, early chat GPT days, you try to ask it to add two numbers, it didn't do too well. Yeah, because it doesn't have this kind of um space of numbers inside the embeddings, so. I remember in the paper, they just mapped this entire 45 directly into the embedding space. Like they just use the tokenizer, tokenize 45. I have to check the, the code again, all right? But if they did so, then there's a chance that you embed wrongly. So it might be better to just use a manual embedding, all right? So, and also I don't agree with mapping numbers because as what I said earlier, when you map numbers into a number line, you will lose the stuff like magnitude. Okay, and that is something that is not great. Not that great, actually. Yeah. So yeah. Uh do 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 think about it. Anyway, I think I won't be able to finish the presentation today. Uh, because we, we did talk a lot of stuff. But uh I'm gonna end on this slide, okay, because uh the next few slides are some experiments. I will cover them next week. Okay, I'm gonna just touch on this slide. We just end here. Uh, as a teaser, all right, to next week's uh, stuff, to continue on, on this week's stuff, is learning reward necessary? So like all along, we've been thinking that reinforcement learning is to learn rewards, but rewards give you a very, very sparse signal because like, if let's say I did something right, you praise me. If I did something wrong, you scold me, okay? But you don't tell me why, okay? Like for example, if I want to like touch my phone like that, okay, every time I touch my phone, I get a reward one. Every time I don't touch the phone, I get a reward zero. But you don't tell me that only when I touch my phone, then I get a reward of one. Okay, so for simple tasks, like you can randomly explore and then I can randomly touch my phone. Sure, 
you can give me a reward why every time I touch my phone. Eventually, I learned that touching my phone is good because it gives me a highest reward. I maximize my reward. I keep touching my phone. All right. But imagine if you were doing something like RLHF, okay? Reinforcement learning from human feedback. Okay, sometimes you get rewarded for being harmful. Uh, sorry, harmless. All right. Sometimes you get rewarded for or you get punished for not being harmless. Then I don't tell you why you get rewarded. I only give you a number. I only give you like a reward of a one for harmless and maybe reward of zero for harmful, you know. But I don't tell you why. Okay, how many of you here, okay, think that you can learn by, let's say, a new subject? Yeah, I don't teach you anything at all. Or maybe I, I, I give you this, uh, maybe we talk about Singlish. Okay. I want you to learn Singlish, but I don't tell you anything about Singlish. Okay, I just ask you to, to write something and then I give you a score of one to five. Okay, how many of you here, you can raise your hand, think that you can learn Singlish like that? If I just give you a score of maybe five for the best Singlish sentence you write, and a score of one for the worst Singlish sentence, like contains zero Singlish at all. How many of you here think that you can learn Singlish like that? Okay, how many of you here think that you cannot learn Singlish like that just by giving you a score of one to five? Okay, y'all cannot be none on each side, yeah? So, okay, so most of you think that you cannot, right? So this very rudimentary way of learning, unfortunately, is is embedded in the whole reinforcement learning uh whole reinforcement learning literature. Everyone thinks learning reward is the best, but but it is not that great at all. It doesn't even teach the the student how to get it. I mean, if you think about how we learn, we learn because someone tells us, okay, in order to write Singlish, you need to use more la le law. You know, I mean, imagine if I'm teaching you English, that's probably how I would do it. I'll use instructions. So you think about it, it's something like instruction fine tuning, right? Yeah. So I, I will give you instructions of what to do and then I will give you the model answer and then like maybe you can learn from the, you can mimic the model answer and so on. You will learn much faster. All right. Using just reward. RLHF. Great, great work, RLHF. You think you can learn rewards well for harmlessness? Sure. I mean, Meta used Lama 2 with RLHF. Most of the times I type there, they tell me that my my query is humble. <laughs> so, so there's some drawbacks for learning like that. Like, I've been trying to hop on this point on the last few sessions. Like, I think RLHF is not good. Okay. And I'm very happy to talk about the rest of the slides on why learning reward is not good. Like, you look at this, just a primer, like, like even in the Greek maze they use in paper, they use a, a, an environment-based reward that is not just binary. All right. Alpha zero, we have Monte Carlo tree search. Okay. That gives you like, what moves are better, you can use the tree search to improve your policy without the reward. Okay, behavioral cloning, you can learn the actions by fine-tuning or like mimicking expert trajectories. Okay, all these show that rewards are actually a very slow way to learn. Okay, and then why can't we just learn from goals? Can we just condition on the end outcome you want to achieve and ask the model to take a step towards there? And actually, large language models are great goal learners. Because you can give it the right context and it can give you output relevant to this context. Yeah, so the large language model is able to do that. It's able to step in the right direction by just giving you like the right context. Yeah, so that, that's something that I myself am amazed. Like I initially did reinforcement learning. I created learning fast and slow because I didn't really like reinforcement learning after a while. Yeah, I found that it learned too slowly. And yeah, I think using memory is very important to like learn faster. And goal directedness, very, very important. I think this is a key ingredient that large language models do very well. Like stuff like auto GPT, you can give it a mega goal and ask it to split into sub goals. Awesome. We used to not be able to do this kind of thing, but now we can. We can use language to ground the goals. Okay, we can even use language, okay? You look at the cut pole like that, all right? So difficult to learn the cut pole just from the observations like that. I mean, if you ask a human to learn all this, how, how is a human going to learn all this? All numbers, so difficult. But you just tell a human, if the pole tilts left, I move my cut left. If the pole tilts right, I move my cut right. You give it semantic meaning. 
you ground it like if Paul moves left, move cut left. Yeah, so if Paul moves right, move cut right. I tell you this as an if else rule, right? You learn instantly, right? And you as a human, you learn instantly. You see, if you ask the reinforcement learning thing, you look at this 200 over episodes still, still cannot really converge well. Yeah, so is reinforcement learning good? Yeah, I'll leave you to think about it here. Yeah, sorry, Nicholas has something. I'm guessing that it's cost of the model free learning versus model based approach, which is probably more efficient. Yeah, definitely. If you have a model of the world, you learn faster. But you know what? In reinforcement learning, you try to use neural networks to predict models of the world. And that also learns very slowly because in order to change the state prediction, you need to learn many, many iterations, okay, in order to do your state prediction well. So model-based methods are only good if you have a lot of data. So reinforcement learning methods, if you have you are model-based, you are data hungry. And that's not good at all. Yeah, at least with large language models, you can just describe the context and it can give you very, very fluid like understanding of that context. Yeah, I, I did this in the up challenge, like the abstract reasoning corpus. I just like like zero shot say some stuff like, oh, we want to translate the object to the right. Then it's able to do that even like, without using like any rewards, just verbal, verbalize, and then maybe give a few short examples. Yeah, so with the era of large language models, do we still need to learn rewards? So I'd like to end on this because in the next week, I'm going to talk more about the idea that I've been having for a few months already, but I'm just lacking the time to do it. Uh, it's called the Goal Directed Decision Transformer. Instead of conditioning on reward, you condition on goal state. So I'll touch more on this idea next week. And then if you are interested to do some experiments with me, uh, do let me know. Because I think this is more or less the future of reinforcement learning. We shouldn't use rewards anymore. Okay, uh, before I end today's session, um, uh, maybe like one, two minutes, you have anything on us so far? Yeah, it's, it's been a whirlwind paper because like there's so many things in this one paper. But the thing I'm going to like focus on the most now will be this reinforcement learning part, the sequence improvement part. Right. Uh, yeah, I'll just end over here. Uh, questions, anyone? Yeah, so a few comments regarding your comments, uh, are shared. <laughs> so I I do agree with, um, so with large language model that, that, that has uh, reasoning capabilities, you can do this kind of a uh, goal-oriented uh, learning with and a result uh, like scalar reversing or right? but but my I think my point still stands which is uh when you only have a pre-trained um language model which you can't even teach it you still need uh, to kind of bootstrap it uh to start from some reward-based learning to the point where um. It can do reasoning. It can understand your instruction. It can't, can't understand what it goal is. It has this kind of reasoning capability. Then you can uh, get rid of uh, this reward-based learning system. It's a, I think it's a similar even to human, right? At the very beginning, when you have a newborn child, like very just a few years, or maybe like just a few months, or you're trying to uh, start teaching it to do something, it's it's kind of hard because I don't. it doesn't even have that good reasoning capability at that point, right? So you you maybe you start to teach it with uh by mimicking or by just let it or even for like teaching animals to do stuff. You can't really communicate well with animal you you do this kind of reward based learning. But for human is maybe I don't know a bit reward based a bit um uh, imitation but to the point where it starts to understand your instruction you can slowly Transit to this kind of goal oriented. You can teach it why uh, or what what is the actual goal, and yeah, then it become much easier to do. But at the beginning, you still need this, uh, this this uh stage where you you have to um teach it with like more primitive, you know, more primitive way, right? So that's my comment. So actually, if you think about it, like teaching in a more primitive way, like for example, if your kid does something wrong, you spank him. I mean that that can be or, or like. Yeah, reward could be like reward with ice cream, you know, like stuff like that. Um, that is, uh, yeah, I mean that that is more primitive and like that's when your kid maybe doesn't understand stuff. Yeah, but, but I don't do I I don't do the spanking. By the way, I have a kid. Yeah, I don't really hate him. Yeah, because I think 
there's a way to actually do this learning without actually using all these rewards. You can actually do learning by example. Like you because kids like to mimic you. You can you can teach people by example. Like for example, if you want a kid to learn how to walk, all right, of course he needs to learn how to walk himself. But if you show him like how you walk or her, show him or her how you walk, you know, I mean, after a while, like through mimicking the parents, they can actually learn without any rewards at all. You can just mimic. Like some humans have this way of mimicking what other people do and and learning from it. Yeah, we are quite good at we are quite good mimickers actually. Yeah, so reward, if you think about it, like the only reward that you learn is actually like pain, pain and joy, right? Like this can be your rewards. Like if you touch uh, a pin, it's painful. So you learn, okay, I'm not going to touch that pin anymore. So actually that's memory, you know, like the next time you see a pin, you retrieve the memory of you touching the pin. And then it's like, oh, I used to hurt myself touching that pin, better not. So that memory is un subconscious. Like when I see the pin the next time, I would think about, oh, I injured myself, even without me trying to do it. Memory helps to serve as the way to guide like, your actions. And this reward that we are talking about, it can be incorporated in memory. The stronger the feeling of pain, the more easily accessible that memory is. Now, when you think about it, is there a real need to teach by reward? You can also teach by memory or teach by mimicking. Yep. I agree, uh, but... but... But that doesn't seem to in conflict with the reward, at least not in the initial stage, because you need to have the reward and in, in, uh, incorporate that into your memory, right? And for yes. on the imitation or the give example based learning part, so I also agree that like this uh at a, it's, it's, uh, it's, it can be a very uh, effective way of learning at the beginning, but the downside of imitation learning, just as in the literature, even for human learning, uh, is overfitting, right? Uh, I give you one example. Just now, you give an example of learning Singlish, right? So if if you have so from my own observation, right, for those pe uh, people who first pick up a new language, uh, basically as an if as a native speaker, you can tell that uh, the that just uh, they're just trying to learn because in some part of it just the way they use what they have learned certain words and phrases, it just sounds artificial. The reason it sounds artificial is because um, it all fits like it just it's not the actual the correct way of using certain phrase and you can tell it so so that's that's the I think that's the the the, the, the shortcomings of just uh, just purely doing imitation learning um, and all these are solved by what by uh, more experiences then with more experiences these uh, we can internalize knowledge then at a point at which point you actually uh, you generalize the, your what, what you have learned right so so but all this really requires the ability to do reasoning that's why you can't do you cannot really do all of this in the pre-lm era so what are you talking about i think it's only possible since we had not had the uh this this uh, model that can do reasoning then, then we can start to talk about like how like trying to really work on it right yeah. yeah, I mean, there's some merit to using reward also. I mean, it's uh, it's useful when you cannot describe what is good and what is bad. Then you can use reward to like condition, like the agent. So maybe a uh, final model will incorporate both, like a reward based model at first, but after a while, you'll just move to like goal based, right? Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's basically in in context learning, right? You have when you do in context learning with uh, RL chef trained large language model, you are doing that. Um, when it has been trained on the RL base, then by now you understand what you really want, you just instruct it, right? Mm. I mean, this is open to discussion, of course, like, I, I don't know, like, what the end outcome would be, but I do know that RL is not the answer. Like, RL alone is not the answer. Yeah, we definitely need to have some form of, like, go directness and now, Nicholas was saying something in the chat. Let's see. Uh, if I recall, I'm just verbalizing what you typed there. Okay, if I recall correctly, there's uh, some things about kids initially learning via unsupervised methods, like playing with toys without a specific goal. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Which forms some form of representations in the future, which can be used in more complex settings. Yeah, I, I like this. Actually, this is the foundation for how memory is stored. I believe like, 
like this is my this is John's theory, right? I believe that our representational space for memory is only formed after like four years old or when we start to have long-term memory. So after that, that memory space is unchanged. Then you can base all your past memories on that that embedding space that you have learned in when you were younger. Yeah. You could you could use that. Yeah. So uh if we keep changing the embedding space, you can't really learn, you see, like because every time you, you learn something new and you change your embedding space, you need to relearn everything again. So I think that's a critical age whereby this embedding space doesn't change much anymore. And yeah, this unsupervised learning might be able to help to form the embedding space. Yeah, I mean, we can talk more about this. Uh, these are interesting points. Um, and indeed, we can. I think we can talk more next week because I think this whole topic on rewards versus goals is a huge thing. It's a huge thing that I'm also trying to push over here uh, because I feel like we are very, very close to unlocking the mysteries of intelligence, indeed, especially with large language models coming up. Yeah, there are actually pretty good insights of like how humans think. <laughs> I mean, I, I know some people will disagree with me, but, you know, all this context-dependent prompting, chain of thought prompting, you know, it's actually very similar to a human. Like, I can prompt you to think in certain ways by asking you certain guiding questions. Same thing. <laughs> I mean, so the kind of things that we can unlock right now with the potential of large language models is immense. And I'm just saying that we shouldn't just rely on, like, this kind of linear, or this kind of rewards that are, like, these are just... A scalar value like this reward that is in this like the return is 21 like in a game that kind these are scalar value rewards and we shouldn't just rely on this yeah there are better ways to represent like how to learn like and this could be in the goal directed method yeah okay enough from me uh any last words before we end today yeah, end today's just, session just one last question you mentioned uh to use your own way to tokenize numbers but yes. I, I'm not sure I'm not sure how is that um viable because uh for if your language is trained your language model is trained with certain tokenizer, it it, it wouldn't work if you change the tokenizer. No, so you don't I'm need to change the tokenizer. To... Uh you just need to like maybe a most rudimentary method is something like this. Uh you just map 45 into token number 45 in the tokenizer. So instead of relying thought, on the token, I this like... yeah, instead of relying on the tokenizer to like group the forty five together, you group it yourself. So you can you do that manually. You can do that man because when you call like oh, take token, yeah. you can they just simply pass the text and then use the token tokenize tokens to like match one by one, right? And then they convert the text. Like for example, the text like I am a student. You convert this to maybe like token numbers like this. So you can don't use the to you don't have to use the tokenizer for this. You can manually tokenize into the number yourself. Ah, I see. I see. Yeah. So you can do that for any tokenizer. It's just that, you know, this 45 here might be something like, you know, this might be this, this might be the word positive. You know, then then you have the semantic priors uh might override the token. Yeah. So so I if see. you want yeah, so this is the problem that we uh, highlighted earlier, that semantic priors still carry over. And if, in my view, if you don't want the semantic prior, you have to train from scratch. Because if not, the semantic prior, the embedding space of that token will be based pretty much on your pre-training data. What is there, yes. then yeah, it, it kind of like learns from the pre-training data. So basically, after tokenization, you, you force it, you go and change it, right? change it according to which one you want. Yes, yes. You ensure that the group, like the 45, will be grouped together as one token. What token? I leave it to you. But my suggestion is you group into tokens like A, B, C, D, E, because I realize this don't carry much semantic priors based on my experiments on up. If you group it as positive, negative, good luck. <laughs> You're going to have problems with uh, arbitrary token generalization. I mean, you look at my earlier experiments that I did with Fu and Ba. Even Fu and Ba also is not, is not semantically neutral, you know? Like, you look at this Fu and Ba here, this movie is Fu. Like this, <laughs> this did not generalize to correctly. Yeah. So, hey, sorry. This is the works example. Sorry, we had to we had to look at the not works one. Yeah. This even something like this, you just change the token to full, right? It doesn't work. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. So you must be very careful about how you how you choose the tokens. Yes. But I thought here you also hypothesized that it might due to the exclamation mark, right? Yeah. Correct. 
So I'm just saying that like changing the token into a random token, um, it it doesn't really like generalize to all cases. Yeah, yeah. it would be good if we can have uh, some some way to throw into <laughs> into an embedding space to see which token is more neutral than others. Then we can just use that. Yeah, I think A, B, C, D, E, all this should be okay. All right. If not, uh, I think I'll end here. Anything else, just uh, feel free to chat on the Discord. This is, I think, a very interesting topic. And uh, the reinforcement learning part is also equally interesting. So yeah, we'll talk more about how to improve reinforcement learning and use LMs for it uh, next session. Okay, right, thanks, everyone. Okay, bye. Bye.